Welcome back to another episode of Generation Elevation. Now, today I have an amazing guest with me who randomly I just met the other day and I was like, yes, I want you on my podcast because her story is so incredible and I cannot wait to have her share it with you today because like I said, I was so inspired. I was like, please come on my show because yeah, you're amazing. So with that said, this incredible woman, she became the top 1% of property investors in her 20s in Australia. She now teaches people how to build their property portfolio. And with that said, I would like to introduce to you today, Olivia Ward. Hello. Thanks, babe. How are you? Absolutely amazing. How are you? Good. I'm so excited to be on this show, especially when I met you. I was like, Girl, we are vibing. We need to get some of this information out to the people. Mm, yeah, 100%. Your energy attracts your energy, right? Like your vibe attracts your tribe. And that day when I met you, I was like, this just must be done. This one must be done. <laughs> Thanks to our mutual friend. Yes, she yeah, yeah, Natalie. Natalie, my bestie. She uh, made this introduction, and yeah, obviously it's like it's meant to be. It's meant to be. It's yeah, meant, to be. meant to be. So, Liv, uh, can I call you Liv? Yes, please. Perfect. So, for those listeners out there that have no idea who you are, and they're mm-hmm. like, okay, who's this Liv chick? Like, how did she do what she has created in her life? Like. If you could share with us your story or go back to potentially how you have become who you are today, maybe three or four major key points that have shaped you who you are. Beautiful, beautiful question. And you know what I like around this as well is that like, this is the stuff that formulates when you're younger is usually what crafts who you are, your belief systems or limited belief systems, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, thank you for asking. So Essentially, growing up, I was a year 10 high school dropout, you know, dyslexic, had age teachers, all this sort of stuff. And I had this knowing within me that, and to describe this knowing, it kind of came from like uh, my world of doing human design. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so I found out a lot about that, that has de- has definitely created um, a little bit of, I suppose my desire and motivation and, and knowing of where I want to go and, and how I want to do life. But yeah, two, two or three big pivotal moments to answer your question. So one would be when I was 15, a big one was my, when my parents got divorced. Um, I had all of this nice stuff all then taken away, right? Including my family home. So like everything was disrupted. So the, the safety net of what I knew was had all changed at 15. I was also very sexually confused um, as well. Um, and so I was really, really angry growing up as a teenager. I was like, imagine like a really angry teenage girl. Like I was like 10X that. <laughs> um, so that was a big pivotal moment. The next one was um, when I was about 19, trying to become a nurse. Totally failed at that. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't even read the questions on the exam. I was like, I have no idea what this is. Failed that. But when I was nursing or trying to do my um, placement, I was like feeding all of like these old people and I was questioning all of these old people about life. Oh, I thought you were going to go somewhere else about that. But yes, I love where you're going. Yeah. So tell me more. What would they say? So I was just really curious as a young person because I just wanted to do life easier. I just wanted to like, I from naturally from a young age, I had this idea where I was like, I was going to try and do life to get, I now call it what I told you the other day, yeah. to get the highest ROI on life. Mm. That was like this knowing that I had my whole entire life. But anyway, so when I was 19, I was very curious about asking those ahead of me how to do things easier, what they would uh, do more of, do less of, what were their regrets, all of those sort of things. So I interviewed a lot of old people or people that I looked up to um, all the time from that curiosity. So one of the things that they all said, actually, they all said the same sort of things. Go and be present. Be present with your loved ones. Network, create relationships, um, travel, go and explore the world. Try not focus on money and swapping your time for money. And if you can have money, create passive incomes for you, which I noticed a trend that most people were blocked by mm. money, that they couldn't be present 
in raising their children. Hell, my dad couldn't, most fathers couldn't because they're the ones out there, you know, being the masculine and fucking raw and, and making money. Mm -hmm. So they forget to be present in their children's lives or that they don't have the opportunity to. So there were some big impacts on me where I was like, right, I'm going to work out how to create passive incomes. Now that was a plant. Those things were plant seeded, right? So I had the nice things at 15 taken away from me. I'm like, oh, I like those nice things. Now they're gone. 19, all these old people saying, this is a hack to how to do life a bit easier and the regrets. I'm like copying people, learning from them. So there were some big pivotal moments. And then the last one was when I was 23. It was like the final thing to shift me into gear. It was when my mum came home one day. So mind you, she's in her late 50s at this point. I'm 23. And my mum comes home and says, oh, I've just spoken to my financial planner. Turns out I'm going to have to work every single day till I'm basically 70. Mm. My parents are financially a little bit screwed. And I was like, ooh. Okay, I need to work out how to help my mum. So, yeah, there were probably three big pivotal moments for me. Wow. And so in that moment where you were like, okay, I need to help my mum and what then did that inspire within you? Like, what did you then go and create? Cool. So then I thought to myself, okay, maybe this is all that you believe at the time, right? So I was like, okay, I'm a year 10 high school dropout. I don't really know how to make money. However, it seems like everyone keeps talking about naturally people just say oh you just invest in real estate no one really tells you why it is to buy your first house just go and do it it's apparently a good decision and also there was this like this belief in the community around us that like oh when you say someone's in real estate oh they happen to have a lot of money so i was like okay seems like i don't need any qualifications to do property investing let's work out how to do that so there was this one kid actually so i used to work at optus for like 12 years Wow. And I had this debate with, and I was hanging out with like a whole bunch of like these um, uh, guys. It was quite, it was in sales role, right? And it was kind of like a rah, sort of like energy, hustle sort of energy, right? And we would all have this big debate of, or all the boys would have a big debate of whose dick's bigger, right? Yeah. And I would just sit there and just watch them and I'd be like, ha, ha, ha. And they'd be like, oi, Liv, what about your opinion? And anyway, so I'd just be, and I came across with my own big dick energy and I was just like, man, if you'd give me 30 cow, I'd just double it. Oh, yeah, how, Olivia? And I would say, well, property, dirt, just makes common sense. And one kid just turned around and said, well, if you know it, how come you're not doing it? And I was like, oh, touche. Oh. <laughs> And so, so the other plants that were seeded before, I was like, okay, they were those planted. This was like that final last straw. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, girl, you're going to go do this thing because you have, you seem to have annoying. So that was the thing that kind of pushed me into it, but I didn't know anyone who was successful in building wealth through property. So I went straight to YouTube. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. And so you learned what you... Like, or, or what initially started you off was through YouTube. Was through YouTube, yep. I literally just, I don't know exactly what I typed in. Something like, you know, how to build a property portfolio. You kind of just scroll and scroll and listen to it. And you just finally landed on a person who I felt a connection with. He mm -hmm. was like, he a like-minded Aussie kind of bogey guy. He never yeah. liked wearing his shoes. And he was like, screw the system. And I was like, fucking love this guy. <laughs> He's everything I am. Hacking, hacking the mainframe is what mm -hmm. I call it. Mm -hmm. And like I was watching him, he'd be interviewed by all, because he got to like 70 properties by 27, something wild, right? Mm -hmm. So because of that, he was also always interviewed on like all the big news channels, Channel 7, 10, 9, consistently, like every two or three months. But I was watching him in the background where they would control what he was saying. Mm. The behind the scenes videos, they're like, oh, we're going to cut that bit out. No, you can't say that bit. The real stuff. And I was like, the whole world is a scam. It's a lie. They're trying to control us. Wow. So I learned from this dude. <laughs> so cool. Um, and back then there was no such thing as podcast or anything. It was just, yeah. you were lucky if there was stuff on YouTube. So yeah, learned from that guy. And I just went into a rabbit hole. Went into a rabbit hole of learning absolutely everything I could. Morning, night, at work, hacking my hours at my nine to five job to get my time so I could learn whilst I was at work. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what that's where I really started, and the sacrifice was deep in the first five years. Mm. Sure. And I'm curious to hear, like, what was that sacrifice like for you? So, like, what do you mean by it being so deep? So, I had to push through what I thought was pain at the time. So, for example, you know, I ate migraines and two minute noodles. I probably sacrificed a little bit of my health eating that sort of stuff, right? I ended up moving home. I didn't go and live in the first house 
that that I bought and most people they had if I described to them the type of house that I lived in in the first five years most people would not live in that type of house today it is it was disgusting but it was all that my family could afford so this is the house that my mom was renting and I said hey mum I know that you're struggling financially but hey can you please let me live here board free just for 12 months I really need to go hard at saving a deposit for my first property and then later on I will build so much wealth. I'll look after you for the rest of your for the rest of your life. Wow. Thank goodness today for my mum to be able to provide that. And that house, it was mouldy as hell. It was like every single room had mould seeping through the ceilings and the roof. Wow. It was in Melbourne, cold winters Melbourne. There was zero heating in this house, so during winter, you would just see like all the mould from like the the air come up on the curtains. Oh. It was so bad. Um, structurally, the house is like, should be knocked down. It should not be livable. It should not be rented out right now, but it still is. You know, it was a local cookhouse. So it was like next door was a local cookhouse with a drug. Oh my God. Drugs. So the police were always, their lights were going out at 2 a.m. in the morning outside my house. And I'm like, I'm trying to hustle doing overtime. And here I was, my first house that I bought, which is not what I teach people now, but because I now know what to do. But the first house that I bought was like a brand new house. And the easiest thing to have done was to have moved into that house. But I teach people that like living in your first house is actually not a smart thing to do at all. Being a rent first up is, mm. is way smarter, which is where you rent where you live. But I was like, I said to my partner, I was like, babe, we've just got to stay here. We've just got to stay here. We stayed in that house until I got to the top 1%. So by the time I got to five properties, I was like, okay, now we can move out. Mm. What was it like for you when you first got that initial momentum towards that vision that you originally had when you moved into like your parents' house? Like Yeah. So the you know what? I always talk about collapsing time. Oh, oh I love where this is going. Please tell me. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what a lot of people do with their finances is their goal is so far away. And it's easier for what well, definitely was easier for me was to say, okay three years away to save my first deposit. And I'm just saving like 42 grand. Mind you, for just for context here, right? I'm working as a uh, call centre worker at Optus, earning just 55 grand a year. Mm. I'm on very average income. And so is my partner. She's working in like admin, earning 50K a year. That was it. So, so we had to scramble in order to save for that first one. And this is one reason why I tell people, I'm like, you only need just to save that first one and then that's it. I teach people how to, they don't ever need any more money of their own money moving forwards. It's just that first one. The momentum was you get into the habit and it was like I could keep continuing to do that. So I was like, okay, we've done one. Now I just need to know how to do the second one. Rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Mm. But the momentum was easier when I had collapsed time and brought my goal forward because I was like, then it seemed like it was more achievable. Mm -hmm. So rather than three years to save my $42,000 deposit, I thought to myself, how can I bring that forward? How can I make it 12 months? And oh my goodness, your brain gets so much more creative. <laughs> that is so cool. So for example, like if someone was listening to this right now and they're like, okay, how do I collapse time to achieve my goals, right? Yes. What prompts or what process would you then guide them through? Okay, good question. I would walk through, what is it that you need by the end? So what, whatever the goal is. And then work backwards from that goal, step by step, break it down into really small micro, micro tasks, break it down to monthly, weekly, daily. And then those daily tasks can be something as simple as, is there a particular podcast I need to listen to, to expand my mind? Is there a particular email that I need to send? Do I need to spend 10 minutes doing X, Y, and Z? Yeah. Sometimes for me to move forward, to get a, a particular task done, I'll even break it down to... Like say, for example, I need to get, I'm going to use my partner as an example, right? She needs to get um, her teeth straightened at the moment, Yeah. right? So there's been a 12 month process to get to that point. So you could break it down as far as Google the number just for the dentist to actually call them. So then you have the number. Okay, step one, one done, blah. So you break, break it down into really, really micro steps rather than making it such a big event or a big task or a big milestone that you need to reach. Because your mind, from a manifestation perspective, can, does your mind believe that you could save, like for me, I needed to save $42,000. That was so huge. And I was not a saver. I hate saving money, even till today. <laughs> but I was like, if I could train my mind to believe I can save a thousand bucks, do I feel like that's possible? Yeah, I do. Then I just need to repeat it 42 more times. Done. 
Amazing. I love how you just broke that down. That was perfect. So I kind of want to take these two directions. The first direction is once you get into that pattern of hustling and scrambling for mm -hmm. that cash, right, and, and achieving your goal, and then you spoke earlier about getting the highest return on investment for your life. Yes. I want to bring those two topics together in regards to I know and have seen so many people get into that habit and then find it hard to break when they have that goal, they've achieved that success, yet they're still scrambling or they're still feeling like they need to chase more. They don't feel fulfilled at that point because they're not actually using what they've saved to go and enjoy life and be present, like you said. So I'm curious how you've navigated that along your journey. Oh, this is such a deep question. Yes. <laughs> okay. For me, I'm gonna, I don't know the real answer to this, but for me, my answer came down to finding out what my true values were. Mm. Mm. Um, and the way that I did that was there is a, we should put it in the link in the, okay, in the yeah. comments. Uh, Dr. D. Tarmini. Yes, D. Martini. Yes. yes. Have yes, you yes. done his value test? Yes, amazing. Oh my God, how good is that? He's okay, amazing. let's put that into the show okay. notes. All right, Dr. Uh, D. Martini, John D. Martini. Yes. Uh, he has this whole thing on like values elicitation and yeah, it's brilliant. We'll put it in the we'll put it in the show notes. Oh my God, I can't believe we've done it too. What a coincidence! <laughs> see. <laughs> like yes. Okay, so I did his values test. Okay. Because I got into this, exactly what you're talking about. I literally reached this in business only just a few months ago. So this is very new for me as well. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I just reached these awesome milestones. And every single time I reached a big milestone, I was like, now what's next? Um, and maybe there's a part of it where if your goals are something tangible or physical or something that's out, that's something that's um, yeah, physical thing. Whereas if, if your goals are typically something that's outside of yourself, bigger and larger than yourself, that's where... I believe the motivation can come from, mm. but your values are going to dictate everything at the end of the day. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, freedom. My number one value was freedom. And the second one was impact. Now I knew those two very, very well, but until I did that values test, I was like, oh my God, all the other ones just after I was neglecting. And so when I realized I could start implementing something each day that was talking to those values, I was like, oh, I feel so much more better now. Mm. So yeah, values and bridging the gap between what I truly desired and what I desired for others around me as well. Because impact was huge. That was huge for me. What has been like the most fulfilling thing that you've been able to do from stepping into this version of yourself? I would honestly say showing other people how they can achieve freedom for themselves. Because so many people say that they, that they want that. They want freedom. Mm. A lot of people aren't willing to put in though to get that true freedom. Why do you think that is? <laughs> it's gonna sound a little bit harsh, but I truly don't. So what is freedom? It's getting, it's having control and having time. Yeah. I truly believe that most people are trained through upbringing mm. to not value time. Mm. If you think about successful people, what are they always trying to gain more of? Their time. Like billionaires and millionaires pay large amount of money to get their time back. And that's where my mind was the whole time. So when I was 25 to 30 in my hustle mode, I was not thinking about five years away. I was thinking about in 20 years away from now. Yeah. Like long, long, like in my mid forties, I was like, how can I make sure I get gain time back, gain time back? Because time was the thing that all the old people on 19, those interviewers telling me is the most precious thing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So time, I think is the thing that holds people back that they don't actually truly, truly desire to have it or they're just, yeah, happy with what they've got. So I feel like a lot of people are content. It's interesting. Like I had a conversation with, I call him Paul under the tree because mm -hmm. I'll tell you that story later, but I've told it a million times on my show already now, but essentially he spoke to me uh, that day and he said that, you know, sometimes we go through these periods of forgetfulness where deep down we have this inner knowing that this is where we're meant to go. This is what we're meant to do. Mm -hmm. And then we get sucked into life and forget that that's exactly what we're meant to do or where we're going. And I, I know that a lot of people come to me saying, Elise, I feel so lost. I'm not sure. It's like, yes, you actually do know, but you have asked everyone else for their opinion. And now you've questioning your own. Mm -hmm. And I bring this into what we're creating here is because for me, when I was in high school, like I was always focusing on like when I'm 40, like I'm just going to be like retired and traveling and doing all the things. Like I was focusing on that time, like so, so young. 
and then I feel like since being out of school I kind of got a little bit sucked into life maybe the last couple of six months six or twelve months where I was like okay I need, need to do things now 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 and I think from my personal reflection it's the society that we live in I guess programming your mindset to be focused on like what's next what's next what's next mm. but not what's next in the next 40 years what's next like tomorrow next week like everyone's uh living for the weekend living for the month living for the year it's like what about the next 20 40 years like you said yes okay cool so this is what you also asking before yeah. the high star of wildlife okay so this is the other part so like how can we make enough money and live for that particular time frame of your lifespan, how can you get the highest ROI on that particular point in your life? So I'll give you an example because I'm probably not explaining it very well. Let's give an example. So say, for example, from 20 to 25, maybe you're somebody who wants to go out and party and because your body's young and you can handle it and you want to get, uh, you want to start off a business and go really extreme and really aggressive because you don't really have much of a, a risk tolerance, right? Mm. Sorry, you've got a large risk tolerance, sorry. So that's generally in your twenties. This is just stuff that uh, what's his name uh, Gary Vee talks about all yeah, the time. Yeah. yeah, same sort of thing. Whereas like maybe you then reach your your thirties and maybe potentially you're now having children, for example, and you want to be present with your child. And from and you're not going to be able to gain back that time from like when they're zero to five was one of the most precious sort of times. Mm. But I'll never forget this one dad told me, and he goes, "Liv, I really miss his daughter's now ten, and he's like, I really miss my daughter." When she was five or six, she'd say, Dad, come watch this Disney movie with me. He's like, that'll never happen again. Mm. And he's like, I miss that moment. I can never gain that time back. So how can we make enough to experience that proportion of your life to the absolute extreme? Same with like traveling, right? Maybe this is another limiting belief, but I don't believe <laughs> that you can um, that you can travel, that your body will be physically able to travel and do all the extreme sports and stuff in your 60s is what you could do in your 20s and 30s. Yeah. 100% like being in London and I'm seeing like some of the oldies like walking around traveling I'm like oh my gosh like sometimes my legs get sore living yeah. there walking around for a day like how do these people do it like I'm like what is going on yeah, yeah. I do not want to be doing that when I'm like 90 no no, no. <laughs> but yet we're conditioned and told that like you retire and you travel then yeah what mm. no you told me the last mainly gone by then so so same thing with money when it comes to generational wealth or passing on wealth to me if you're say for example if your parents are going to pass away and then pass down generational wealth to you they're in their 80s you're likely in your late 50s early 60s by that time again like how much of an impact is that money going to really have on them mm -hmm. the impact data shows from research the biggest time to impact and give back that wealth is actually from like 25 to 35 wow so if you're a parent out there right now building generational wealth and want to give back to your kids, how about thinking about passing that generational wealth onto them now in their 20s or 30s earlier than when it's too late? Because that's the time when they're trying to build businesses, have kids, uh, do all these you know big milestone things in life that could help advance them a lot. Wow, I love that advice. I think that's really beautiful because... You get to also experience your family, experience what you've created, and you get to see them get joy and fulfillment from that as well. Like you get to experience that whole thing with them rather than just with them. passing it on when you're like dead. Like that, you don't want that. No. Yes, exactly. You get to see them enjoy that. Yeah. So, what, so many people come to me, and I'm not joking you. They, say, I'm like, how much? What's your goal? Like, how much passive income do you want? Most people say, it used to say $100,000, it's fucking skipped to $200,000 in the last six months. But most people Love say, I need $200,000 of passive income. I'm like, okay, where does that logic even come from? And most of them aren't even earning $200,000 a year. And I'm like, what would it take though for you, for those who have parents or for those who just want to be start a business or something on the side? I'm like, what, how much do you actually need to cover your basic living expenses to, for you to be able to free you to be able to do that set thing? And guess what? Most people, the, the amount of money that they actually in the need might be forty or sixty thousand mm. dollars of passive income coming in to be able to free them of needing to pay for those bills, so they can give them the safety net and the, I suppose, the the creative exploration time to feel like they're comfortable enough to say, right, I can take this really slow. I don't need to rush and hustle. Mm. And I can do this properly because I know my basic living expenses are catered for. Like that freedom 
is more impactful than saying, oh, I need $200,000 because I need all this extra stuff that you don't actually even have now. Yeah. Mm. So what was what you think? So I want to go back to how you said that we, the subconscious programming of people not valuing time. And mm. I want to emphasize the subconscious programming side of things, especially in regards to money mindset, because... I've had many people come to me and ask me at least like, can you please do a podcast episode on like money mindset and getting over scarcity? And I think like Liv, you're like a perfect person mm. because I really believe that you'll have some like absolute gold nuggets for the listeners today mm. on how to switch your perspective around money to potentially manifest or allow in mm -hmm. more opportunities, be present with more opportunities so when they do arrive, you can jump on them rather than be resistant by fear. Okay. Cool. All right, this is a big one. Three segments here, and I need to say both of them, all three of them so I don't forget. First one is the visualization of manifesting, so we'll talk about that one. Mm -hmm. Second one is really understanding how money moves, so let's talk, I'll briefly talk, talk about inflation and the scam behind that. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. the third thing, prosperity. Okay. True financial prosperity can come from all of us sharing our knowledge. Mm. So, like, what prosperity comes from all of us being wealthy. Yeah. If I have true to, to financial time and freedom because I have passive income just looking after me, it naturally allows you to think larger than yourselves and give back. Because my basic living expenses are catered for. If you're ba think about if your basic living expenses are catered for. I ask people all the time, what would you then do with your time? Most people say, I'm going to give back in some way. <laughs> As I'm going to look after this person, my family usually first. And then you, people are like, oh, I would love to help with this project idea. The community. I'm like, imagine then if all of us had it. Yeah. So money's not bad. Money's not bad. We are taught from, from such a young age that the bad person is a guy with money. Mm -hmm. You think about it, look at, look at all the cartoons, shows growing up as kids. Who's the guy with the money? It's usually the bad guy. Horrible. Karen Ware talks about that a lot. Wow. Yeah. So, like, already we're indoctrinated from such a young age that money is bad. No, it's not. It's just fucking energy, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Literally energy. I you love this. Just enhances you. That's it. Um, and so, for me and all the people that I know and all my mentors who have loads of money, you wouldn't believe the amount of charity works and things that they can do to give back time. Yeah. Right? My partner, for example, who has time back, she, she volunteers once a day for an animal shelter. Uh, sorry, once a week, sorry. For an animal shelter. Yeah. Giving back into a community to a small non for profit animal shelter that can't, you know, that has like a lot of challenges. So, so that's one is the prosperity. Uh, the impact of that is, yeah, having more money for all of us can have a larger income, a uh, larger impact. So, that's one. Number two, okay, manifestation. I learned early on that visualizing what you want and where you desire to be is a hack to literally track training your brain to say, well, I'm going to have this because I'm going to literally, I am already visualizing that that is my future. Mm. So you, you're basically, it's kind of like giving your, your brain like this glass ball of your future. Yeah. If you could trick your brain into saying that that's my future, it's done. If you just know it, it's going to happen. Wow. So what I would do, <laughs> one of the hacks that I would do when I was younger is I would drive, I would be like, okay, I want to drive a nice car, for example. So I would go hire, or well not hire, sorry, go and test drive a car. A nicer car but guess what i would go to the next level i would go, go grab that test driving car and then i'll go to the next level up car yard to then go and test drive the next level up from that one but i would rock up with the other test driving car oh my god <laughs> so I go up that. Up. yes right yeah so that's one way to visualize you seeing you feeling sitting in the car touching it it's mm. reality it becomes when you can see it and feel it touch it and smell it all those senses kick in and it becomes more true, mm. it becomes more relatable. Another common one is, you know, maybe you're like, you want to go hang out at nice, fancy hotels. Well, rather than booking the $1,000 hotel, you know, you could just probably go and have coffee at, at the bottom of the cafe yeah. for that hotel or have dinner there or something. Um, hang out with the people, watch how they manoeuvre and just people watch. Very, very powerful. Mm. So yeah, the manifestation is a big one. I um, love that. I've actually done that before. Not you? not drive the test car to the test garage. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I've definitely drove the test car and been right. like, this is, yep, uh, this is mine. Yeah, love it. See? Yeah. And did you feel like it was more real? A hundred percent. Like it, it allows you then to go and take what you, you experience in that moment mm. and then 
properly visualize it specifically when you then go to meditate or visualize later. Powerful. Yeah. Powerful. Because you don't truly know what's um, available to you until you see it. Because some mm -hmm. people don't have natural visualization skills. Yeah. Here. No. So getting that taste and that feel is up as Or, for example, say you want a big yacht as well, right? Yeah. Let's just full go extreme. Love it. Let's just say you it's want a big extreme. yacht. It's yeah, it's not extreme. Normal. You could, for example, hire a jet ski mm -hmm. for 50 bucks. Yeah, true. Go and ride your jet ski and then do some circles and then go and drive that jet ski to where all the yachts are. Yeah. Pretend like you're hanging out on that yacht for the day. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Simple. Yeah. Simple. <laughs> I like well, it. It's simple anyway. Well, it is. Yeah. And that's the thing. I, I really believe that there are potentially people listening, but I've seen a lot of clients, especially out there, think that they're unworthy of that experience mm. to then fall below themselves and, and don't even realize that it's so easy to yeah. actually go and experience. Yeah. It's easy to experience abundance, luxury, love, happiness. However, you need to also let yourself experience mm. that. Mm. And not attach it. So babe, if you're listening to this and you have that ickiness with money, just know it's just energy and you deserve it too. Mm. Because just whatever you do with it, you will just amplify it more of who you are. That's you, it. you know, I was um, listening to a talk on this specifically about your relationship with money. And imagine it being like a person or someone that you're actually in a relationship with. Oh, my goodness. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so if, if you're always saying to that partner, okay, you're never enough. I want more of you and you're just never showing up for me. Like, if you're saying things that you say to money, to your partner, they'd probably tell you to get stuffed. Yeah. They wouldn't want to come home. They wouldn't want to come back at the end of the day. But, oh, I'm just going out, but I'm going to come back. And if they go out and you're texting them, being like, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? I'm going to come get you. You're being needy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to run away. Yeah. So how about just chilling and then treating that energy mm -hmm. as if you're in a relationship with it, a loving caring, abundant relationship, mm. and then watch your one perspective of money change, but also two, what you're then, the opportunities that then come to you from that energy, because you're going to be attracting it rather than resisting it or repelling it away. Amen. Cash flow, current flow, water, Ooh. all from the same thing. You realize that money all comes from like water Wait. or a bank. Wait. Oh my god! Oh, river bank, bank, <laughs> money, cash, flow, flowing, currency, current. Oi! Oi! <laughs> the energy right now, I'm like, yes. Whoa. Okay, so then the third one was this inflation scam. Okay. Now, please explain. All right, I don't want to go this deep in it because it's a little bit. It's it, okay. It's a bit extreme. So, high level, money is literally just printed out of thin air, just to let you know. <laughs> uh, they started doing this in 1971. When President, President Nixon talks, took us off the gold standard. So I'm going to give you the most simplest way that I describe it. Say, for example, you have, before 1971, you had one bit of money moving around in circulation. For every one bit, I'm just going to call it a bit, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. For now, right? Might as well. For every one bit of money moving in circulation, there used to be one bit of gold backing it. And so what's gold? It's something that's tangible. It's physical, right? So there's, a, there's, there's only a certain amount. It's capped. And so in 1971... President Nixon, and I say this, America, because most of our currencies are all traded in US dollars. Mm. This is why it's so important. He took away and removed that rule in 1971. So before 1971, it made sense to save money. From that moment onwards, it didn't make sense to save money. Because inflation, which is where they print money, it's just going up and up and up and up and up and up and up. And that is the, uh, believe it or not, the actual name of the money, um, the type of money formula that we're in it's called a keynesian monetary system that is our monetary system that we're in which is essentially it has a design to all to print just that little bit of money and the state the, the subconscious sweet spot is this two to three percent number that they talk about so the people who control the money can literally print it out of thin air it's not the government it's the people above that and so Ooh. us as humans yeah. once you understand compounding mm. us as humans physically cannot work and save as hard as what compounding can Whoa. so we have to invest in money yeah. you've got to invest it's like the only way to get ahead build big businesses two two wealth buckets it's as simple it's as simple as what everyone is what the, the big wigs teach us 
there's only two biggest ways the wealthy the wealthy bu uh, bucket the wealthy people are in two yeah. buckets business and investing in property fact so if you can be in one of those two buckets or at least two of those buckets then if you can get two boom yeah um helps your uncle you're in so um back to the inflation thing compounding we can't work as hard as it so stop saving it's a silly thing to do save to invest mm -hmm. straight away get your money working for you i love this you're amazing <laughs> you're amazing <laughs> The second thing is inflation. Hmm. We also cannot make as much money as what they print. So why go up against that? Be in the areas that benefit from printing money. And so for me, the reason why I love property is because when they print money, the wealth gap gets bigger. So like the richer get richer, the poor get poorer. So when they print money, what happens? All these things, these living expenses go up. You know, the water, your gas, electricity, the bill, everything goes up. But guess what? I can personally, my pain is alleviated from all of those things going up. Because when I have property, well, property benefits from it in two different ways. The values of my house go up when they print money. And my rents go up on all of my investment properties, which means my cash flow goes up. So inflation is good for me as an investor. It's bad for those who don't have assets to go up with it when they naturally just print it. Because you can't stop them printing. Mm. So you might as well put your money over there that benefits from inflation. And inflation is the biggest thing that I don't like to use fear as a motivator. Um, actually, I just talked about this last night in my stories. I don't like to use fear as a, as a motivator. However, it is something that genuinely motivates me um, because it's something I can forecast the future. I don't know exactly what moves they're going to make, but I can forecast and see where our monetary system is going. And yeah, and inflation, you just can't beat it. And it's something that... You might as well just say, well, you know what? Let's benefit from it instead. Mm -hmm. Wow. So for the listeners that have just come along this journey with us, they're probably mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, amazing. And uh, I know that we need some people listening to this who are ready to invest in property and things like this, mm -hmm. but there will also be quite like younger people who are potentially just finished uni and they're like, I don't know what to do with my life. <laughs> and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm feeling so overwhelmed right now. So like, what would be your advice to them who potentially like, okay, I know I need to do that. Mm -hmm. However, I'm not in the position to do that right now. What would be your advice? Okay. Advice would be, especially when you're younger, um, you don't, you have a large risk tolerance. So go hard. You typically have, uh, when you're younger, you don't potentially have cash. You typically have time. So then use the time to leverage and learn more. So go hard at learning something. Um, exactly what it's, so I'm just teaching exactly what I did, right? I was poor, but I had time. So leverage the time to learn the things. For example, I have heaps of fucking training, like free training stuff. Just go film my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So you could do that, for example. And collapse the time. So save your deposit as hard as you can. Live, go live with, reduce your living expenses as much as you possibly can. Yeah. Roof over their head and your house, your transportation is usually the first things. And work out how to increase your incomes as well. So maybe get a side hustle or start a business or do the extra overtime. So like the sacrifice is what you have to make when you're, when you're first starting out. Mm. But if you're somebody who already owns a home, for example, like let's just say you own one house and you've got equity in that house, you don't need to do that. So you're already one step ahead. Yeah. yeah. You don't so need any money. Mm. So, okay. And so let's say they're doing that. Let's say there's people that are in that sacrifice mode right now. So it's like almost the in-between. Yes. You're in the in-between. Mm -hmm. What would be your, I guess, uh, maybe encouragement or encouraging words to the people that are going through that hustle mode right now mm -hmm. and are feeling like, oh my gosh, I don't see an end to this. Should I just give up? Like at some point? What would be your advice to those people? I'd say just look to future you. Mm. Mm. How would future you look back at this moment? And if you got through these hurdles, would future you be proud? Fucking absolutely. Yeah. I'm always looking to future me. Would future me be, be proud of the effort that I put in? And just try to do the best that you can do for that moment in your life. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's for me. Yeah, I always just look up to future me. It's a big thing. Yeah, I love that so much. And now, Liv, I have one last question okay. for you today. Okay, before we wrap up. So, I asked all my guests this one. And... You don't have to answer it with anything that we've spoken about today, okay. but it's the first answer that comes to your mind, okay? okay? So whether you channel it, whether it comes to your heart, to your mind, whatever works for you. Mm -hmm. However, 
for if you were to tap into the energy of generation elevation and just the collective right now and whoever is guided to this episode mm-hmm. what do you feel that they need to hear right now you're not alone yeah that just came to me um you're not alone and you're not crazy in the things that you think and feel because the community and how we've been raised and conditioned, it's it's probably normal, but you can also get out of it. Everything is just a belief system in our minds that we've been told that can be undone. Everything that you want to achieve or skills that you want to learn, it can be taught. Everything is taught. Yeah. Like if we're taught to walk and talk from a young age, like how you can be taught anything, including undoing a limiting belief. Yeah. So I'll leave you with. That is so powerful. Thank you so, so much, Liv. Now, where can my following, the listeners here today, where can they find you? You know what? Just look up Olivia Ward on any one of your social media platforms that you run. Amazing. We'll pop it all in the show notes as well. Thank you awesome. so much for joining us today, Liv. It's been an absolute pleasure. We went into some quantum portals and things like that today. But yeah, like I said, it's been a pleasure having you. You're amazing. Thank you so much and love what you're doing. We can leave here this. Thank, Thank you. you.